Okay, so welcome to our session today, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so this is our commercialization plan in 90 minutes. Uh, and it will be run by Karen Ukoff. Before we start, I'll just do a quick uh, round of introductions. I'm Hannah Choi. I'm the program manager for the Manning Isles Innovation Awards, among other things. And um, presenting today will be Karen Ukoff, who's our director of Isles Venture Development. I also wanted to mention that in the room is a couple of our fellows, our uh, summer MBA fellows who are joining us. Their names are Adrian Berry and Jane Sokonia, and uh, they are also in the room with us. Um, with, with with that, I'll just let Karen sort of kick it off. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm going to start sh by sharing my screen. We are going to try to get through a commercialization plan in 90 minutes. And I'm going to ask uh, Hannah and uh, Adrian and James to uh, keep an eye on the chat because I will not be paying attention. Uh, OK. So we're talking about a, creating a commercialization plan in 90 minutes. This is really in response to the fact that we're asking you to include these elements in the Manning Isles um, proposals, but more broadly, I will touch on how that fits into uh, a longer term view of, of commercialization as well. So a quick reminder on the team, you know, Peter Reinhardt, of course, uh, is really leading the Manning Isles effort and uh, uh, Hannah, uh, uh, introduced herself. I am the director of IELTS Venture Development and also the site director for the National Science Foundation Innovation Core site on campus. And it's my privilege as the director of IELTS Venture Development to work with the business innovation fellows throughout the year and to have three fantastic summer fellows with us. Uh, Talvin Avariga, who's not here today yet at least, Adrian Berry and James Oconia. So. Uh, we are all here to help. A quick reminder on the program mission for the Manning Isles Innovation Awards. We're really looking to advance translational and applied research and development efforts to support the development of spin out and startup companies or the out licensing of UMass IP. So, uh, you know, it's really um, focused translational research to make prod progress towards some kind of commercialization event. I think you've all seen this graph before. I just want to touch on it briefly uh, you, to remind you, we're really thinking in terms of projects that in, within one or two years would be ready for external funding. Uh, and that can mean a couple different things. Uh, it can mean most likely it means an investment ready startup or technology, but it can also mean licensing agreements. Um, we love to support that. And it can also mean uh, in some cases, it's unusual for a tech driven company, but, but revenue from customers and uh, revenue from customers is, is always something you wanna be striving for. It's, it's really, you know, customer, no company, no startup, no law, large company survives without customers. The purpose of the funds is to is to increase the commercial value of your your project and or de-risk it. So by that we mean just take risks out of the equation so that investors, including federal funding agencies, can have greater confidence in investing in it. Uh, you know. Only one page, but it, uh, it's only one page explicitly, but it's a key con consideration in other sections as well. So we've talked about how, um, you know, we, we talk in the call about the ex putting the commercialization plan elements into the executive summary. But as you start to do that, I think uh, as you start to develop your proposal, and as you start to think about what is commercialization really looking like, then you will start to see that. Um, it really uh, impacts every single section of your proposal, uh, including, uh, you know, certainly the statement of work, which is going to be about your translational research, but where what customers want, you know, the unmet needs you're you're satisfying, or the uh, the the milestones that industry might look for before forming strategic partnership might come into play in. Uh, your research plan. Uh, another area I'll just highlight is in the biosketches. 
uh, you know, you all do biosketches for your federal grants, and that's great. But if you have an advisor who uh, from industry who has relevant experience, you may want to include that uh, not as a biosketch. They typically often, no one from industry has a biosketch almost, but uh, something as simple as their LinkedIn profile. Uh, you know, just you can just generate a PDF. That's what many people are using for resumes. Uh, these days. And that would be great to see because it would show your connection to industry. Uh, these are some common questions that I just want to put out there right now. Uh, I'm aiming with the rest of my slides to answer all of these, but we'll return to them at the end in case uh, I haven't. Uh, first and foremost, we'll talk about what is meant by a commercialization plan. Uh, we talked a little bit already about fitting everything into the one page executive summary, but we'll talk more about that. Uh, connections to the TTO through the IP strategy, uh, who, sh who should be on your team, which is a really key question and, and one for both the proposal and for uh, if you're planning a startup or if you're planning for licensing going forward. Uh, defining a product candidate, finding funding vehicles beyond manning aisles, and then what's an, an impactful commercialization milestone? We have, there. it's not always the same as a research milestone uh, or a, um, a milestone of the sort that would be a report to federal funders, that sort of thing. So we'll just talk a bit about that. Anytime um, you have other questions or you wanna question, you know, raise a question about one of these, uh, put it in that chat or raise your hand, Hannah, and. Uh, the fellows are all watching that for me and just they'll just say stop um, and and uh, we'll stop and take a question in the middle. So the the first thing is, uh, you know, what is a commercialization plan? And I really want you to think about it as a living document that explains how you and your team expect to de-risk or add value to this from a commercialization perspective. So uh, certainly, you know, de-risking includes showing that the technology works, showing that the technology uh, doesn't do harm, uh, you know, a bunch of those, uh, those things that I think you are already thinking about. Uh, but it also means perhaps demonstrating that uh, someone in industry is interested and, and how do you do that? There are a bunch of ways that we can talk about, but but it's important to be thinking about managing risk on both the technical side and the non-technical side. And then adding value is the, is the flip side of that. Can you get, if not a customer, can you get uh, someone in industry who's willing to be an advisor or who is um, uh, willing to put a little bit of, uh, you know, if, if, if your research turns out to be, you know, if your results turn out to be, uh, you know, promising, then we're going to think of, we're going to consider um, funding a collaborative research project with you, or we're going to take another look at your technology, show it to our scientists. There's, there's a lot of soft ways to add value. And then of course, there are uh, more substantial ways, like we filed for a patent. We've had a patent granted that are very tangible. Uh, typically, a, you know, you, people use a commercialization plan as a roadmap a source document. So to the de-risking and adding value uh, point, you really want to synchronize your R&D and non-R&D efforts, not to get too far ahead uh, in either way. Either I've seen either um, ca cause problems, but you really want them to be synchronized. Um, it's often a roadmap for grant applications, uh, you know, when are when will we be at the stage when we can apply for an SBIR? What do we need to do before we do that? Uh, when are we going to be at a, st a stage when we need venture capital? Let's work backwards to when we need to start our investor pitches. Uh, all of that, of course, rolls up into time-based milestones and expected outcomes, uh, including first first investor. Uh, actually receiving an SBIR award, those sorts of milestones. Uh, the six key elements we're gonna talk about more today are product candidates, unmet needs, differentiation plan, uh, 
an intellectual property plan, assembling a startup and spin out or spin out team, and then making sure that you have the resources to support development of all that into a self-sufficient enterprise or in a way that would result in a license. So in short, how we expect to go from the idea where we are now to an operating funded startup or license that is ready to, ready to uh, soar. Above the level of our immediate commercialization plan, but still response to the, this is how we expect to go from idea to an operating funded startup is, um, or is venture development's venture assessment scorecard. And we use this really to try to assess startups and pre-startups we're working with. And I just wanna show you how this works because we it fits the commercialization plan that you're gonna do from Manning Isles into the broader context of, of how can you think about developing the startup and, and where you are in that. So a little bit of a, a, a navigation you know, a device to get you oriented toward the bigger picture of long-term start, longer term startup efforts. Uh, and really we think about ventures in three stages, ideation and conceptualization, exploration and validation and implementation and commercialization. Uh, and to navigate those three stages, we think about six different categories that are not that far off from the commercialization plan. We think broadly about technology and product uh, and especially going from technology to product. Uh, intellectual property, yes, starting with your UMass portfolio of intellectual property, but also asking a question, what are you gonna do uh, looking forward? Are there opportunities to, to um, create new IP? And are you able, uh, you know, have you thought about how you're going to do that in the future? Um, team and venture structures, uh, you are all so accomplished. You know, the, the PIs who, who submit um, Manning Isles proposals are, also very accomplished already at managing labs and multiple projects and graduate students. But uh, you know, th there is running a startup is, is a whole different uh, ball game in part because you don't have the resources of the university to fall back on. So we start thinking about that early. Uh, it, it's a different, you know, it's just a different environment. And uh, we want to take on those, those, we want to help you to think about that early. Market discovery and development, as I said before, no startup, no company survives without customers. So even before you have your technology, you've done a, uh, invested a lot in your technology, you wanna, you wanna have some indications that there will be a need for your technology if you build it. The number one source of failure of startup companies, according to CB Insights is, uh, building a product that no one wants. It's a failure in the marketplace. And, and so you want to really avoid that. The second most common fa uh, point of failure, I will tell you, is um, not having the right team and they're interrelated. So, so we're really trying hard to, to uh, be mindful of those. And then funding and in-kind resources, where do you get the, the resource? Where, where do you find the resources you need to build? Uh, and then how do you bring that all together in a business plan? So um, within that context, I just wanna make the point that all of the six commercialization plan elements that, that we uh, ask for cut across all of these uh, categories, venture assessment can categories. So what your product candidate is going to be really has implications of course for technology and product very directly. But then also, what intellectual property do you are you might you create in the future? What intellectual property are you taking from the university? And uh, and also intellectual property in the sense of do you have freedom to operate? We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, do you need other intellectual property that is owned by someone else? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so so this is just another way to say uh, how does your R and D effort sync up with the, the uh, other elements that you're, you're, uh, uh, you need to attend to? And how do you think about that in the context of your Manning Isles proposal? 
I just want to touch on each of these six categories, commercialization plan categories briefly, uh, just so we can be really clear on what we mean. So product candidates, you know, we're going from maybe a molecule or some kind of a electronics on the bench top or an idea for a new design for, a, for an airplane, all the way from a molecule to a therapeutic, a pill in a bottle for someone uh, when it's commercialized or uh, you know, a piece of electronics embedded now into an electronic device um, or a new concept, new approach to, to airplane, uh, an airplane, maybe a new material to coat the airplane or to, to, to actually having something in an airplane. That's a long path and we know it. Uh, but again, you, it's, it's unusual to have, uh, to have uh, the core technology licensed without some additional work or at least thinking about it. And that's what Manning Isles awards are meant to do. So we want you to be thinking not only about your core technology and how to advance it uh, to the next, its next level of development. But we want you to be thinking about far out here, what would you commercialize? What would be the, what would be the product that you would commercialize? And certainly if this is too far out, you know, what would you license? Uh, would it be the direct UMass IP or would you, you add value to that? Um, uh, you know, what would a, you know, what would a commercialization mean from a strategic partner's point of view? What would you need to deliver to them? And that might be an early version of the product, or if in the case of selling directly to end users, it might be a full-blown product. So here's some of the early versions of a product that you could be thinking of. Do you have a therapeutic candidate? It's still not uh, completely validated, certainly far from FDA approval, but what is your therapeutic candidate or candidates? Do you have a demo uh, of, a, of, a, of the technology? Going beyond the demo, can you put together a prototype or a minimum viable product or a pilot product? And, and so you can see that it's a continuum, but we, we wanna see sort of the far out picture of this as well as the near term, what are, where are you going to get to next? Unmet needs, you know, what problem will you address? What unmet needs will you address? Uh, there are th three general ways I think about this. One is uh, societal problems, very high level, you know, um, uh, very le high level health problems or energy problems. Uh, you know, we know that we need better storage capacity for renewable uh, energy generated with renewables. Uh, we know we need uh, carbon sequestration, social justice issues, equity issues. We know we, you know, it's an unmet, and equity is an unmet need in our society. Those are fantastic starting places as are technical challenges. Uh, we don't have the right technical challenge. Uh, we don't have the right technology to meet some challenge that, that industry, uh, you know, unsolved problem in industry, that's great. But at the end of the day, what you really want is to address a customer's needs and, and, and wants. And you really want to get a sense of uh, in the commercialization plan of who has the problem, how severe is it? Now you can't know until you make a sale that that that's really going to be the customer you're going to end up with. But uh, we want some thinking about it. And as I said before, part of de-risking is um, is uh, having some evidence that in fact customer. A customer that you think might be a customer would actually be interested, and that's where a program like iCore comes in, because there you're going out and actually talking to people. It's primary evidence, uh, you know, uh, reading quotes and in, in articles, reading market research is great as a foundation. But just as you, as scientists, want to do things in the laboratory, there's no substitute for getting out and doing it yourself. Uh, and iCore is here to help you with that. So customers broadly construed, because you know, yes, we want you to think about customers, but we want you to think about customers in as end users, certainly, because everybody's gonna want you to think about end users, but also who would be your, the investors who would, your, this project would appeal to? 
uh, who might be the strategic partners and who might be potential licensees. So it's great to say we plan to license or we plan to get strategic partners. But again, knowing who those you that you've identified someone who might be uh, a, a potential strategic strategic partner is important if you've talked to them actually uh, on a non-confidential basis. Uh, that's great too. Uh, some of you may even have confidential conversations. That is something to talk to the tech transfer office about before you do it. Differentiation plan is really important. Uh, this is how are you going to be different and better in the long term? Uh, and there are three perspectives here too. Uh, one is the technology perspective, of course. I think I, I'm guessing you all know who your scientific competitors are. Do you know who your business competitors are? And do you know what alternative approaches in the in industry uh, are, are maybe the ones that are, are, uh, are in play right now? Those are all really important things to know. Same with a funding perspective, who's getting funded, you know, which of your, what, what funding agencies are um, looking for solutions in the area you're trying to work in and what are their priorities and can you be different and better to them uh, as they are making their investment decisions. And finally, and still you'll get this and uh, this is a theme, um, what's the customer perspective? What's the end user perspective? Uh, and I've just provided here a little example of one way to think about competitors. Uh, you know, it's just a really simple matrix uh, where you would list competitors and yourself along the top. And then you would pick out, and I've picked these out arbitrarily as examples, but you would pick out attributes that would be really important considerations uh, from the customer's perspective uh, uh, about of, of what it is that will make you stand out. So here, you know, efficacy greater than 80%, no co competitor can achieve that. Perhaps no competitor can achieve efficacy of over 50%. You know, you, you really wanna to start to, as much as possible, quantify your competitive differentiators. Non-toxic, this is something everybody, everybody, whatever this is, it's non, everybody's is non-toxic. So that's great. It means yours needs to be non-toxic too. Um, and, and you just wanna be aware of that. And then something like shelf st stable or temperature range or whatever is relevant to your, uh, you know, results in under five minutes. There are lots of different things that can be competitive differentiators. I, and, and so these are just examples and I urge you to think about them in terms of your project. Uh, this is something that uh, for any of you who have worked with the Business Innovation Fellows will look pretty familiar. For any of you who haven't, uh, I'd love to talk with you about what we do in this area and how we can help you. Not as, quite aside from the Manning Isles proposal. Um, and intellectual property, this is where this intellectual property plan, you know, I hope everyone here has already spoken to the tech transfer office and is in regular communication, even um, in, in case you uh, are at the very beginning, even having a conversation uh, before to, to figure out what you need to put in an invention disclosure that would make, uh, you know, would make it through to, uh, uh, provisional patent would be really important. And, and I would urge you to do that um, sooner rather than later. It's much easier if you can have several conversations in my view, rather than go, oh, I'm gonna give you a talk in two weeks and I really need you to do something. Uh, so, so that's my plug for the TTO. You can see the policies and documents that they work with here and get information about how to contact them um, at their website. And, but beyond the TTO, we really want in a commercialization plan to think about building protection. If you're presumably you are, if you're going the startup route, you're gonna think about what additional um, intellectual property might you as a startup protect yourself, you know, as uh, in, under your business uh, entity, but you could also be thinking uh, more broadly about uh, you know, working with partners. There's there's a ton of things you you could be thinking about. 
one, the other resource on campus I wanna be sure everyone knows about is this Patent and Trademark Resource Center. This is uh, funded by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. We have a full-time patent librarian in the Science and Engineering Library, Paulina Borrego. She can train um, you or someone on your team to in the in the various um, uh, specialized search tools they have, including um, because it's a USPTO uh, resource center, they have the patent examiner's database. So this is an opportunity to get a really broad view of the patent landscape, see where there might be opportunities for you that you haven't um, you haven't really thought about um, because it's not directly uh, part of your research, but see where there might be opportunities as you go forward. So the startup team, who you know, is really who's going to get everything done, um, you know. If your proposal and project are funded, how will you build a team? Uh, we certainly, I think, you know, we want you to know that if you're going to hire a postdoc on the team, you, you can put in your team list, uh, postdoc TBD, uh, so that we understand that there is somebody coming on board. If you already have someone on board who will be funded with Manning Isles, uh, by Ma a Manning Isles uh, award, and who will be uh, part of the team. That's fantastic. And is that person doing the science or is that person doing science and part of the startup team? All of that is really good to be thinking about now. Uh, so the, the core to that is uh, start with the founding team for a startup, if that's what you're, the route you're going to go. Licensing might be a bit different, but, but think about if, if we spin this out of the university, who would be on the founding team and what would their roles be? This is a great article. So, you know, you're going from this, this group of people to an org chart, uh, but this is a great article, how to spin your, your scientific research out of university and into a startup. This is from Y Combinator, which is a widely respected venture accelerator, um, global in reach. Uh, and this is a really uh, thoughtful article that uh, gives, some very practical guidance about how to think about, about this issue. Uh, at the same time, you will want to be thinking about who else will you need? Uh, eventually, no, no, you know, not yet, but eventually you're going to want to think about building a so-called C-suite, you know, the, the chief executive officer, um, the chief financial officer, et cetera. But who's going to do those jobs in the meantime? And what do you need in the way of, if not hires, if not employees, other people to help you. You know, do you need subject matter experts? Do you need technicians? How about science and technology advisors? How about business providers, uh, business advisors, and um, service providers? You know, if you if you're thinking about um, uh, going after venture investment, you will need. Uh, well, if you're thinking about creating an entity, even you'll want to be talking to uh, an attorney, an accountant, and that kind of thing as you move forward. So funding, of course, is the big thing for everybody. And I would say funding and other resources because one of the key things for startups and for pre-startups is to make the most use of in-kind free resources that you possibly can. So the I'll talk in a minute about the four buckets of funding. We usually think about grants, non-dilutive funding. They're not gonna take a share of your, your a company if you create one. Uh, or when you create one, investors, that's dilutive funding. They expect you to have an entity and they expect that they're going to take a share of your company. Uh, and, and in return, they're gonna increase the va value of the company by giving you uh, money to grow. Industry partners typically are dilutive as well in some way, but you know they may expect uh, exclusivity. They might expect that they're going to invest, be treated as an investor. You know, it, it it can be a gray area. So so, but they are can be an important source of funding, um, uh, and and then customers and sales. Just because we should never lose sight of customers and sales. In kind resources, you know. So Isles Venture Development is really trying to be an in kind resource. Um, we provide teams of business innovation fellows. 
We also uh, offer startup law office hours, and uh, we uh, are increasingly working to connect uh, connect startups and pre-startups with advisors and mentors externally. And of course, uh, I'm available in that role as is Peter Reinhardt uh, pretty regularly. And so we're, we try to do that. Uh, this is really, uh, of course, Manning Isles is at the top of this. It's a great source of non-dilutive funding, grant funding. Uh, i uh, is the national i program. Uh, provides $50,000 awards to uh, pre-startup teams and startup teams to go out and talk to 100 potential customers. So you know what I said about validating so that someone will want the technology or the product that you are building. This is a vehicle for that. It increases if you are uh, potentially an NSF, an NSF SBIR applicant. Uh, there is considerable evidence that Having done a national i team increases the probability of success. Success rate of NSF SBIRs right now, I have been told, is 10 to 12 percent, and that it goes up to uh, close to 50 percent if you have done a national i project. If you are looking for foundation funds, the library has a great database, the foundation directory online, that lets you search. Uh, one of the advantages university-based startups have is that you can apply either from the faculty lab or from the startup if you have a startup sometimes, and you really wanna just make the most of the resources you find there. For teams that have um, a student um, or students who are uh, really involved and, uh, and maybe on track to be founders especially, although that's not totally necessary, uh, venture well, is a great source of sm small grants. They have a program called the E-Teams um, grants. It's great training for a graduate student in writing proposals, but it is also uh, gets some training on the business side and some prototype funding, small, like $5,000. Full disclosure, uh, I review grants for them, uh, and but we've had a really good experience at UMass uh, with those, and we'd like to see more. Maroon Venture Partners, if you all are not aware, is the is our um, our uh, uh, affiliated venture fund. It, it was set up specifically to invest in ventures with a UMass affiliation. Charlie Johnson and the Eisenberg School is the uh, is the managing director of that, and we work closely with them to show them what's coming in the future. Mass Ventures is a quasi-state organization that provides both grants and you know, non-dilutive and dilutive funding. They run the ACORN Awards. Uh, they also uh, uh, support the Mass Life Science Center Seed Fund and, and uh, the Mass Clean Energy Center uh, uh, grants programs. And, and so they have quite a broad portfolio. And they bring and they also bring you things like the Massachusetts Life Science Innovation uh, Day. Uh, so give some visibility to startups. Of course, the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, in, in addition to its investment in IELTS, uh, has funding for some great uh, non-dilutive and dilutive uh, opportunities for, for uh, startups, and including an internship fund that I think is just really, if it's really effective funding. Uh, to hire uh, interns from into a uh, into a startup uh, total, you know, you get reimbursed for the interns you get, you and you can really, I've seen companies use that and really add value because they can make scientific progress um, or business progress with those interns. Same with the Mass Clean Energy Center, very similar programs, although maybe not as uh, broad in scope. Uh, the Mass Mutual Catalyst Fund is a fund that uh, is, is uh, part of Mass Mutual that is committed to funding startups outside of the, the Boston metro area. And, and so uh, I, I'm on the investment committee for that. Uh, you know, so I advise, but, but again, something that we would think about in terms of your startup going forward, and you should think about in terms of your startup going forward, that they're a venture capitalist basically. And you could think about lots more. Uh, one of the things the business innovation fellows 
can do is identify venture capitalists, uh, venture capital firms that are investing in companies in the space you are operating in. So again, that market focus, what problem are you trying to solve might be very important, as well as what product venture funds can, can focus on either or. And then the Mass Biotechnology Council uh, provides uh, support for, for uh, identifying external mentors, as well as uh, we're starting to talk to them about how we can effectively use their connections uh, for partnering to identify partners. Uh, so, you know, just bringing this all together is just a reminder. Uh, you know, you're going to want to put something about each of these into the executive summary, but also into the state statement of work. Reflect this in the milestones. You know, obviously the statement of work is going to be about the work you're going to do in terms of your R&D, but all of these uh, six elements will inform uh, inform the shape of your R&D perhaps, or at least um, you know, proceed in parallel. And then milestones, uh, you know, again, uh, we're happy for you to reflect milestones on these non uh, R&D elements along with, uh, uh, along with uh, your R&D milestones. Uh, we'll talk what about what an impactful milestone is in a minute. Budget, people, all the appendices, of course, letters of support. If you have somebody, uh, you know, from industry who's keen on on this, and and you can demonstrate that through a letter of support, fantastic. All right, so this is, um, uh, you know, so with that said, you know, this is just we want to share this tool for visualizing. Um, your commercialization plan, because often this is something that startups and pre-startups do do is they, they're trying to get everything in sync, uh, in sync. And, you know, if we think about this as uh, R&D to move your technology from lab to a commercially viable application, this might be your year with Manning Isles, or it might be even uh, beyond that. Uh, as you start to think some, not all of these things will be in the same, um, all, not all of these non R&D activities will be within the Manning Isles year perhaps, but we'll just start with, oh, uh, sorry. I always forget to take it out of full screen. Um, we'll start with, I'll kick us off. I'd like us this to be something everybody unmutes for and uh, maybe chimes in on, I'll start with this Manning Isles proposal and I will put it here. Uh, but beyond that for funding, but beyond that, uh, I'd love for people to unmute and, and just talk about how we would sequence some of these things. So maybe IP is the easiest of these. So we'll start with uh, and maybe there's there should even be for some of you an earlier action item, but the UMass invention disclosure. And again, this timeline is really conceptual because if you if we were in person, if you were with your startup team, you might have a whiteboard and post-it notes so that you could move these around and you could look at, uh, you know, you could compress or stretch the time frame. Uh, often these end up as Excel spreadsheets uh, in somebody's on somebody's hard drive. But before you do that, it's much easier to sort of move things, be able to play with things and move things around. So, uh, so Karen, yes. Yeah, um, I just wanna ask a question about this. So it, would it be helpful, like some of these things we may have already accomplished. So is it helpful to put some of your prior work to see where you've been uh, or your prior achievements or? No, so there is a section in the proposal call for for uh, progress to date, and okay. yeah, and if you think about that as progress to date, I think that's great. You know, so most of your progress to date is going to, of course, be the your scientific work, your research, but but um, yeah, I mean, so this invention disclosure and maybe even the provisional patent are the kinds of things where you know you can't you can't file an you can't have a provisional filed until you've made an invention disclosure and tying that to your previous work would make a lot of sense. 
So, uh, and of course, you could have more than one provisional. So you could have that be previous work, but there might also be another provisional patent in your future. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so where would, um, uh, let's talk about, let's talk about, um, you know, after a provisional, what happens? You, you, um, you know, you file and you, you hopefully you file a non-provisional patent, but there's a that you have a year after the provisional is filed. But what happens in between that? Typically, you're doing research, but what else is needed to to inform the non-provisional patent? Any thoughts? What does the TTO say about this? Typically a prototype, right? Sometimes a prototype, yes. They might ask for a prototype or they might ask for at least a lab demo. Generally, they want somebody on board to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you can get that, that is fantastic. Yes, that's ideal is to have and I would pop that up to the next level which is I would say they at least want background research on markets and competitors because they yeah they want the they might want a lab demo they might might want more data but they also want evidence that somebody's going to even if you don't have somebody pen in hand they want some evidence that if if they invest in a non-provisional patent somebody is going to put that patent to work because those are expensive. Uh, and, and so, you know, what's your background research on on potential markets, potential customers, potential competitors, and why? Again, this gets directly to why are you different and better, and who's going to at the end of the day, if you build a product or even the raw technology, uh, you know, if you if you refine it a bit and and add a little bit of of technical proof, is anybody going to want it? So you can start to think about how these things uh, uh, start to sequence. Uh, and and Jim, I don't I don't know. Do you have uh, you know if I agree? Maybe you want to say more about actually having somebody in the <laughs> a fish on the hook to to pay for it. I do you? Yeah, that, that's useful. I mean, they certainly like to see that. So we've, we've done this a couple of ways. You know, some of them have been filing uh, provisionals when we do have somebody on the hook. Another way that I've done it and, uh, you know, requires a little bit of creativity, but if I think it's a good idea, I funded some of this uh, from my RTF with oh. an agreement that I will get paid back if and when it gets licensed, right? And so that's happened a couple of times where I've been able to pay myself back and I've got some investments out there in the IP that are, we'll wait and see if they get paid back. So, I mean, TTO does have a finite pool, you know, and I think it, it's helpful if you've had things that have been licensed in the past, uh, they're probably gonna be a little bit uh, more, um, willing to take on a little bit more risk, I think. Uh, but, you know, I think it's, it's obviously an important thing to do. So uh, if you have faith in your technology, maybe a conversation like that is useful. It's, it's worked for us in the past. So you uh, so you're a very seasoned faculty member and inventor, and we've got some uh, faculty on the call who are on the Zoom today who are super, uh, you know, who are, you know, have just started or just, you know, have arrived within the last year or two. Uh, can I can I impose on you to just reflect on how how to get started? Do you have any words of wisdom? Yeah, well, I think it's important to get the provisionals in. And keep in mind that you do have a year, but it's difficult to introduce new subject matter, right, to the provisional because that ends, you know, when you go to do the non provisional, because that actually constitutes a new filing. So I think rushing it can be a little bit of a mistake, right? The other thing that you can do at the provisional stage is it doesn't cost anything really to file except for the lawyer's time. So if they review it, then you'll have some money in there, but I would make that very broad. And then I think the mistake that we see time and time again coming out of the universal universities that the non-provisionals, when you go to file those, they shouldn't maintain the same breadth as the provisionals uh, because then they're going to get hung up in the prosecution, right? So I think the important thing to do, 
because it's a mistake I've made in the past. The important thing to do is really narrow down your provisional, right, to the most important space that you want to protect and then prosecute that first, right? Or you could file a broad uh, non-provisional and expect that you're going to get a restriction requirement, right? But be ready to narrow it down really fast. I mean, I think we've kept things too broad for too long in lawyers like that because they want to continuously file divisionals and divisionals and divisionals because that runs up their fees, right? So very broad in the provisional, narrow it a bit, a bit more in the non-provisional and then be pre prepared to really narrow it down and go after a restricted you know, requirement after that. So I think think carefully about what's in there and then have a strategy to narrow quickly as well. That'll, that'll get you the fastest path to allowance, I think. So, um, so, so the other thing I, I wanted to point out here, Karen, is this PFI. Yeah. Yeah, we've applied for that mm -hmm. it's in process, but it, it's a good thing to do because it makes you think through a, a number of the elements that you guys have here in the, uh, in the innovation uh, grant program. You start thinking about teams, start thinking about the commercialization uh, process and it's pretty good money. It's a half a million dollars if you do a research partnership, and it will also fund you to participate in the I Corps, uh, which is a good thing to do as well. And actually, they've started. Uh, if you, if you have if you haven't done an I Corps before you apply for the PFI, for everybody who doesn't know, you have to do you have to have done an I Corps national program, uh, either before or during the PFI. If you mm -hmm. win a if you win a PFI. It turns out now that they're actually adding funds to the PFI if you do it during the PFI. Yeah, that's right. So it's the, they cover the fifty thousand dollars in the in the program. And and uh, and again, and I think what's your experience? I didn't realize you'd had a PFI, uh, or you. Uh, it's it's in process now. Oh, well, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah. I think it's a really good way to draw in an industry partner. Um, yeah, so for ours, we solicited uh, letters of support and we tried to build, you know, more or less the ecosystem uh, to get to the product demo. So we have, for example, somebody where we can do the scaled up production and then we have a customer as well in the, in the PFI, right? So it's starting to build a lot of the elements that you have here, right? How are you going to get there and who cares when it's done? Uh, so I, I think the PFI was useful from that point of view. And so it'll build your team while you're writing the proposal. You know, hopefully you're successful, but even if you're not, I think it brings a lot of those elements together. Yeah, and you've done a national i -Corps. Yeah, I've done a national i -Corps, and that was useful. And I learned a lot from doing that. We did it on a slightly different technology. And then the student became very valuable in part because of the i -Corps experience and went out and got a tremendously lucrative job. So <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't take that one anywhere. But looking yeah. back at it, it probably wasn't the right opportunity. You know, so I, I think in the end, you know, the I Corps did its job there, uh, but it taught us how to think about this opportunity. Yeah, I I, th I think that is the goal is is not just to to work on the one project with I Corps, but to learn a skill set that that is uh, complementary to your research mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah, I think that's right. So, uh, so, so you can imagine the sequencing of all of these pieces is going to be a little different for every project, and there will. Be and of course, there will be other pieces that you you need to bring in. You know, I just want to highlight this one, which is uh, uh, contact initial contact with regulators. That's going to be very different from something that's going to go through the FDA, uh, you know, drug approval process, the medical device approval pro process, or the EPA, or need a certification from some industry standards group. So this is really just. Uh, you know, sort of a conceptual uh, thing. Thank you, Jim, by the way, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, you know, I, this is just a conceptual approach to get you thinking about how to think about how to synchronize all of these elements with your R&D. Any other questions, thoughts about this? Anybody want to place a tile somewhere on this or talk about the sequence? Like we know a granted patent would go after the non-provisional, but it probably will go somewhere way off in the future. It takes a long time to get a granted patent. Um, hopefully not too long as, as Jim said. Um, so where would the milestones fit in here? What of these is really a milestone? Hi, 
having a patent granted would be a pretty good milestone. That would be a fantastic milestone. Having, if you think about just the intellectual property, you know, the invention disclosure isn't a milestone. It doesn't it doesn't add value. It doesn't maybe it de-risks a little because at least you've started the process. Provisional patent, as as Jim was saying, cheap and and you know, it's only it's only gives you a year of protection. You file a non-provisional, yeah, you know, at least there you've got a stake. If it gets granted, you've got you've protected uh, your invention. But the grant, granted patent, of course, adds an, another level of value because now you've got a piece of property, of, a real piece of intellectual property that is yours, you know it's yours, uh, and, and that's really important. How about, how about establishing an entity? Where does that belong on the timeline? So, so, uh, that depends. It's a great question. If you're going to apply for an SBIR, it, it, you've got to you've got to establish an entity about three months before you apply for the SBIR. So you might, you know, so you can think about it that way. Or if you're going to uh, apply for anything where you need the entity, then you need the entity. And I think, and that is definitely a milestone: is you've made the decision that, to go forward. Um, but what do you need to do before you establish the entity? You need to figure out who is establishing the entity. So you want to think about for each of these milestones, you want to think about, okay, what does that mean then? Well, we need to figure out who the founding team is. And there's typically more to that than just, um, you know, uh, uh, okay, it'll be the three of us who are sitting around the, the kitchen table. Uh, you, you know, then you start to think about, well, uh, it's called the equity split. Uh, you know, who's going to own how much? Mm -hmm. And then you also have to start thinking about, well, who's going to create the entity for us? Are we going to do this just uh, online, do it yourself in corporation? Or are we going to go to an attorney? Do we have an attorney? This is one of the reasons we started Startup Law Office Hours, is to have an attorney who can talk to, to pre-startups at UMass before uh, before they are even at the point of having decided to establish an entity. Uh, some very important considerations about that. Any, Jim? Karen, yeah, could you comment on, you know, the pros and cons of one to establish the entity? Because once you do, then you've got the whole conflict of interest yeah. uh, concerns that kick in. And so I think the timing is pretty important on when you pull that trigger, just from that point of view. Thank you for for mentioning that, Jim. Yeah, I don't have we don't have conflict of interest on this, but conflict of interest is certainly um, a really important quest, uh, consideration. So, uh, and sometimes you need to file conflict of interest. Jen Dene, who is the associate vice chancellor, I think for uh, compliance, runs the conflict of interest process. Uh, as you all know. Uh, I, as I hope you all know, if you are establishing an entity, you do need to uh, let them know so that you can establish, uh, so that they can set up a conflict management plan. Because if you think about it, you are, you and possibly p other people in your lab, you're working on your research, you're working together as faculty, graduate, student, postdoc. Now you're establishing an entity together, there is the potential there for conflict of interest. And what the conflict of interest management policy does is make sure that you're in compliance with all of the rules to be in good standing with the university. And that's actually a very um, helpful, protective thing, but you need to lead the target here. And so, yeah, before you establish an entity, you want to uh, file in Kuala, uh, you know, get that started, you, you get that started by filing in Kuali. Um, I, my own opinion is you need to establish an entity when you, when you need to establish it, either because you're going to apply for an SBIR and you can't do that without the entity and all the registrations in place, so that takes some time, or perhaps somebody wants to invest some money, or, you know, in which case you would want to um, uh, establish an entity, or you want to uh, talk to the TTO about taking an option on the technology 
as an entity. You can't do that as an individual. So there are a whole bunch of reasons to establish an entity, but um, uh, there's a bunch of stuff that goes on before that. So uh, yeah, Jim, do you have an opinion about starting an entity? Does that answer your question? Um, we're, I'm working through that right now because, you know, obviously, you, you know, some of the funding considerations change, you know, who's paying for the IP uh, changes, what you can do in the lab and what you have to separate uh, from the lab changes. So I think we're right at that tipping point for us on this particular opportunity. So we'll probably go ahead and do it. Uh, but I am thinking about when the right time yeah. <laughs> to do it is, right? It's, it's a little bit of uh, a little tactical, I think, in the end. Uh, uh, it's very tactical. I completely agree with that. And I am not a fan of, there was a stage, um, there was a stage uh, in startup world, not just at UMass, but all sorts of places where people said, oh, we're going to do a startup. First thing we're going to do is create an entity. And I don't think that that's, I've never been a fan of that. I think that that more tactical, more deliberate approach of starting an entity when it's to your advantage to start an entity or when you need to start an entity is really the better approach. And then do it thoughtfully, you know, do it, do it in mind also, if you think that you've got, uh, you know, you might be going after investors, equity investors, you need to think about what kind of entity are they gonna wanna see when you go to them? It doesn't mean that you're, it's locked in stone. When you establish an entity, there are always mechanisms for converting an LLC to a C-Corp uh, or to redoing things if you need to, but often redoing, having to redo things because a, you know, a venture investor is doing what's called due diligence and goes, you know, I don't like the fact that you've given equity to everybody who ever gave you five bucks and, they, and you've told them that they get a say in, in every decision you make. Some of those things that sound good at the front end when you're doing your, your an entity yourself without an attorney will could potentially interfere with uh, invest investment later on, and so you really want to uh, be mindful of some of those pitfalls of all of this. Guess, yeah, I guess one way to think about it is it's maybe a gen donate question, right? But I don't think starting the entity initiates the conflict, right? Because if the entity does not, at least not with the technology. The, the question I have is once you sign that option with the university for the IP the university owns, I think that probably starts the conflict clock, even though right. it's an option and not an actual license, right? Uh, well, I know, no. Jen, like, I know, I think that's a little fuzzy, at least in my mind. Um, but, fuzzy would be good. I know, but I know that Jen likes to hear about it before people start the entity. And there are good reasons for that because. Uh, you know, the, it takes a while to just get everything going. And I don't, you know, so, so there's, there are reasons to start earlier. And if you actually just submit on Kuwale and there's no conflict yet, and they get the committee set up, I, you know, I, I, my experience is it's, that's something where it is better to be a little early than a little late, especially because the, they're, the con the way the conflicts process works is that they need to set up a committee. The committees meet only every so often. And so if you're at a point where you need something right away, you actually want to have that committee in place before they need to decide anything, I think is the safest way to do it. There's on our IELTS website, there's a we have a page on um, called Startup Know How Talks. And there's actually a, um, a video on how to create a UMass startup. And Jen Dene is part of that. So, uh, you know, there are some answers there as well. Anything else? So would uh, securing a pilot customer be considered as a milestone as well? Absolutely. Anytime, anytime you get a customer of any sort, uh, you're, it's evidence that someone wants what you're building. Uh, you know, so 
if you get a pilot customer who's maybe, especially a pilot customer who is really fully participating, uh, you know, it's possible. I've seen startups, not at UMass, but other places, get what they think is a pilot customer, and and what it really is is is, you know, they. You know, they say, oh, anybody in your company can use this. They call that a pilot customer and then nobody uses it. That's not very productive in my view. But if you say, you know, our, our, um, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, put this, put this, uh, our, our technology in place in your factory and uh, your engineer, you know, in your research line and your engineers are going to test it and you are, and we're committed to, you know, they're committed to letting us come and watch. And, and to giving us feedback and, and, and they're gonna give us so much time and so many materials. That's a really valuable kind of pilot customer. Yeah. Evidence that, of market need. All right, so you all get the idea. Um, I'll just add that customer discovery is what i does and you'd probably put that somewhere around here as well. And it could actually be, um, yeah, or you know, we might back these two up. Uh, it is something that uh, uh, I'm authorized as the ICOR site director to tell you that the vice chancellor for research thinks is an important piece of evidence in that decision for uh, converting a provisional patent to a non-provisional. All right, so here are our common questions again. Take a minute to look at them. Um, you know, if there are, if there are things that you're feeling like we didn't talk about and maybe Jim would be good enough to engage one more time and talk about, um, do I, when do you think I need to go talk to the TTO about my intellectual property either? When, when do you think I need to file a new invention disclosure or, I mean, you know them well already. So, so well, what's your advice on that? Especially for someone who hasn't been to talk with them. Doesn't yeah, have a well, with them. Sure. Well, clearly you want to do that ahead of, there's two things that you want to do that ahead of. One is any public disclosure, right? Because we certainly have to let the students present and write their papers. Uh, so if you've got something that's important, uh, you think it's important, you don't have the customer identified yet, I would still get, you know, at least that provisional and it doesn't cost very much. And I think TTO is fairly cooperative. And that gives you a year to start, you know, identifying people or at least showing that there's somebody on the other side that's interesting. Uh, the other time it's important to do is if you have a company that wants to sponsor research at UMass, you need to get that filed so that it goes in as VIP, the background IP, into the sponsored research agreement. So there's no confusion at all about who owns that idea once that clock starts with the corporate partner. Uh, because then that can get really fuzzy really fast. So, uh, you know, I think those are probably the two events, at least for the provisional. And then converting to the utility, you know, TTO is going to want to see evidence of somebody being interested. Um, you know, then you can, you can think that you may need a little bit more time. And that's when we've had conversations with TTO about how to, helping to defray some of the expenses. And, you know, it's a hit out of your, out of your RTF and there's never enough of that to go around. Um, but you know, it's something that you could do and an issued patent does give you some credit in academic circles. So you can think about it as an investment in your, in your research portfolio in your career and if it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic advice, I think. And thank you again. Um, any other questions, concerns, not, not just about the questions here, but about anything else? I hope I've, haven't talked anybody out of pursuing commercial translational research and commercialization projects. Can I ask yeah. a question, um, Karen? This is excellent. Thank you so much. And it's nice to see it all fully laid out. How much of this, I, I guess I'm going to put my card, we're, we're definitely at it. We've talked about this. We're at a young stage with the idea and conceptualization. So how much of this is it okay to say, look, we're going to figure this out during Manning Isles or much of this should we be like have figured out and like, hey, we're like, we're a train that's already moving kind of, um, I guess I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, now I'm not so sure after today. So, so, so the way I look at it and it's only me, you know, so there sure. are the external, I can't speak for all of the reviewers. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. But, but the way I look at it is um, 
you know, it's much easier, just, just like in research, you need to start with an idea. In commercialization, you want to start with an idea. So you may not have any evidence that, that, uh, that you know, of, of uh, who your customer will be, but you have ideas about who your customer will be. And, and if you can say something like, you know, this is who we think, you know, this is, I'm not sure I would use the word hypothesis in the proposal, but this is our hypothesis of, of the unmet need we will satisfy. And here are the steps we're taking to, um, to, to, to uh, prove or disprove, you know, to find, or even we know we need to find customers and here are the things we're going to do. We know we need to validate the unmet need. Here are the things we're gonna do in parallel with our translational research to identify that. And we might, you, 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 know, you might find that you would actually uh, you learn something that would impact your research plan. But, but that's, that's sort of, I mean, you already know that. It's, I think it's fine to say you're gonna do it in parallel. But I think what's, what especially external reviewers have looked askance at is people who say, here's my research plan. After I do my research plan, then I'll get to this other stuff. Okay, yeah. So I guess the, the piece that kind of register when somebody mentioned that, like the, I think it might've been yourself, that having the granted patent would be a milestone. I mean, that's, that's still, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, okay, okay, good. Yeah. No, you should not wait that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right, perfect. And, and, and so, I mean, so the other thing about uh, going to the TTO early uh, and uh, that I've seen is that sometimes if you go and you talk early about, you know, here's, I'm thinking about filing an invention disclosure, could you file a provisional patent on that? Um, you know, they might say, we need this additional data, or they might say, um, you know, could, they, they might explain the current way the patent, you know, patent decisions are being made. And say, you know, you, 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 this is not patentable, but if you added this, then yes, we could file an, a, a provisional. And so you, want, you might want to work toward that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else? All right, well, I'm gonna uh, go on to plug this list of um, resources. Uh, we're gonna send out the slides after this. So you can see, I'm gonna probably add a couple of things before we send this out, but um, uh, you know, intellectual property, uh, some of our pre-startup and startup development help um, and, and some funding sources. So, so uh, with that, I would just gonna plug a couple of other things that are coming up. First of all, it is definitely okay not to have all the answers. So to, uh, to Cajal's point, uh, you know, we're not expecting that, uh, uh, but we, we're hoping that you will, you know, we're hoping through this to alert you to some of the important questions. Um, that you'll want to work, you know, you'll want to look for answers to be able to answer in, in, as you go forward. Uh, sign up for office hours. So the, the summer business innovation fellows are holding office hours tomorrow, two to four. Uh, to help, and they have each had the experience with a number of pre-startup and startup teams working through that venture assessment scorecard. They are uh, there to sit and work through with you. Our experience is that faculty are very hard graders on themselves. We're not here to make, you know, we're not here to, to, to this is not a sort of a grading thing. This is a how to get you oriented toward where you are in this process. We've, we've found some teams, uh, I've seen some teams and some startups both within UMass and outside of UMass who might get way out in front on, a, on one particular, in one particular category uh, and still be lagging in others. And often that's uh, not useful. And so we just especially want to use this as an opportunity to help you spot any gaps uh, that, that maybe, you know, really uh, deserve attention. And then uh, Hannah and I have office hours every Friday through July 9, which, oh my gosh, that's coming right up. Um, but every Friday, two to four, 
one-on-one -on -one office hours. And the sign up, the links to sign up for both of those are at the Manning Isles main page. And of course, contact us at Manning Isles if you have any questions. Uh, I'll leave it to Hannah. I'll, I just wanna throw it back to Hannah to make sure that she gets the last word if they've missed anything. Um, and thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Karen, for that wonderful presentation. Um, hopefully everyone um, has been, you know, that was informative for everybody who attended today. Um, again, as Karen mentioned, if you have any questions for us, please do sign up for an office hour. Um, we have office hours this week, next week, July 2nd, and the week of July 9th as well from two to four. Those are, those, how, um, those slots are specifically for if you have questions while working on your full proposals that sort of come up, um, we're happy to address them with you and go over and have a discussion. Um, the venture assessment uh, office hours with the fellows are really specifically to kind of assess your, your strengths and gaps for your particular project or venture. And um, if you, uh, if you have any questions that sort of just require a short email, please do email us. But thank you so much for attending. And we're really, um, we'll uh, send out the slides and the recording for you sometime this week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.